Yes. Hi, Florence. Hey. Hi, Charles. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? My back is aching from shoveling snow. Oh, boy. <laughs> I will miss which. Good afternoon, Kate and John. Hi. Let's see, Tina. I think, Howard, we should Good. give it another go. minute or two. We still have quite a few people joining. Yeah, I'm I can't see you. It's okay. I'm too deeply doing it here. Oh, no. This looks like one of the best uh, viewed uh, Zooms we've had in a while. It is. <laughs> Great. Rich Dreisbeck just joined us also. Oh, hi, Fritz. Hi, Fritz. Hi, Fritz. Hi, this is Joyce. I wondered if this will be available as a recording afterwards. One of my sisters can't make this uh, time. It yes, will. it will be. Oh, there. Hi, Joyce. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. Nice oh, that's, uh, Hi, What's your name? Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, get a haircut. Hello, oh, John and Kate. The recording Hi. of the Art Alliance's uh, YouTube channel. People keep flooding in. Do you want to get started, Demetra? Yeah, maybe I'll go ahead and get started and I'll just have you handle the uh, waiting room to continue admitting people. That's fine. All right, can you go ahead and hit record, please? I've already done that. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Fired Up, the new education series by the Art Alliance of Contemporary Glass. As many of you know, this series is free and open to the public, so we encourage you to spread the word. And as Howard mentioned earlier, if you do miss one of the programs, all you have to do is go to YouTube and visit the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass channel, and you can find all of the past recordings on there. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have John Littleton and Kate Vogel with us, an exceptional, exceptional team um, that have been working together now for over 40 years. So it was a little bit tough to try and narrow down what to show you guys in terms of their work and their story, but um, we are really excited to show you a, a small glimpse of what they do and in particular their new public art project, which is just phenomenal. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to John Littleton and Kate Vogel. Welcome. We'll go ahead and share our screen right away. Okay. Here we go. So at the core of our journey has really been the collaboration in our shared lives. And our, our ideas come from our work. They come from dreams, shared conversations, life experiences, observations, and just the process of making things. You often talk a lot about what you're going to do as you make it, and ideas pop up during that process. And in this talk, because it's 45 minutes and we've got over 40 years of work that we've done together, we're going to just share a little bit of it, give you a little glimpse in, and share insights into our process. And we're hoping that even though it's just a small glimpse in, that it will give you some sort of concept of what our collaborative process is like and how we work. I grew up in a family of glass. My grandfather was a physicist at Corning Glass Works and research and development. My father was the first one to teach hot glass in an art department at a university system. And I was introduced to glass when I was studying printmaking in Italy and my roommate there said, you know, Madison has got this fabulous glass program. So it was at the University of Wisconsin where John and I met. And we started working together in dad's studio in North Carolina. He had retired there in 76 to um, try out making his living as a glass worker, as a glass blower. 
And it, that studio was amazing because it was surrounded by the Penland School of Crafts. So there was artists coming and visiting all the time and Harvey invited in people from all over the world. So it was a really amazing education as young artists to be right in the middle of all of that. Starting out in dad's studio made it easier for us to collaborate. One of us didn't have ownership of the studio. We weren't really attempting to make uh, specific work when we started working together. So we really focused on um, doing something where we were playing with the material and just exploring the many possibilities. In 1980, we moved to Bakersville and set up a studio together. It's still the same studio and property that we've lived on since then. Um, our early work is really soft forms. We were playing with how fluid the glass was and how it responded to working with it. Um, those pieces laid the groundwork for work that we would do later on. Um, they, um, they were containers and vessels, but we weren't thinking as much about what they contained, but that they could be a container. So further into our soft form career, we uh, got a commission and uh, worked with the Foundation for the Carolinas on a a space that had two separate areas. And in that space, they were really looking for something that would tie the two spaces together that was playful and fun, colorful, bright. And so we created this piece and this is the first time I worked on something this large. There was 98 bags in it. And it took us out of just having to think about idea and concept, but how do you execute this? So in this piece, we had to think about, okay, how do we get this color range? And so we were like researching which colors would give us the rainbow. And then it's also numbering all the parts. Thinking so about working up the system to hang the bags in that space. And it really laid the groundwork for further large commissions that we would do in the future. So in our bag series, all, as with almost all of our pieces, they evolve over time. And we were at a dinner party one night when we were talking, there was a group of artists who were sitting around drinking and you know, eating a great dinner together, having fun. We were talking about if you have a container, someone will always put something in it. And so we were talking about if you wanna control what's in the container as an artist, you have to put something in it. As we got better at making them, we could put three inside and we saw that they could stand on their own. And we, that started the Acrobag series. We started assigning these pieces, personalities. We'd think about them as little kids climbing up your leg or the storyteller with them all gathered around you. Or acrobatics. We have three children, so it was easy to picture this. And they're fun and you're working with color and form of them. And we thought, well, maybe it's time to start working a little more directly with these ideas we're having and started direct casting in glass. And with those early pieces of the direct casting, we were really trying to just capture the emotion of the person that we were casting. They're, they're not altered at all in the piece like this. We just wanted you to feel an emotion when you looked at the person. We made an agreement that if one of us had a, a fairly finished idea, we'd work together to try and complete that idea in glass. And the process itself, all sorts of things would change it along the way. And if you went down into a series at all, you would be very, very difficult for you to separate whose idea started the series. So as we were continuing to work with the faces, we also started working with the concepts of inner and outer. We started altering the waxes. We were no longer just doing direct casting, but started working with what a person holds within them as well as what we might see on their outside. Then we started working with these forecast pieces. They're a controlled environment, a little bit of a view into like a voyeur of what a person might be thinking behind that mask they wear. And with pieces like, with pieces like these, Every time you come up with a new concept, it's not just about that you have to think of the idea, but then you have to figure out how do you bring that idea to life? How do you make it alive? And it was always really challenging with pieces like this. Some of them annealed for up to three months. We had a huge amount of failure with them. 
And so there's a really big learning curve when you take on something that's unknown. And back then we couldn't like research it on the internet. This is 1994. We didn't know anyone else who was working with this thickness of glass and the kind of um, inclusions we yeah. were working with. It just made it a lot more difficult. So a lot more that. trial and error. Uh, we set up our furnace so we could pour cast almost like a bronze pour, but we're pouring the glass into a graphite mold with models inside. This one has an inclusion that's hot work glass along with the investment hands and the, the pour cast glass. And the hands are actually airspace. Once the piece is cooled, we dig out that, mo that model, that mold inside and all the outer surfaces get cut and polished. In this piece, you see that central energy that's held there, that potential. You'll see that it shows up in our work through the years again and again. It's something we come back to many times. In this piece, the hands are in between a form that could be a sun form or the sky and a form that could be an earth form or the roots, the rooting, and it includes uh, blown glass, cast glass, and electroplated copper on it. So this is the, we both jokingly call it our shelf of failures, but it's also our shelf of possibilities and new ideas. So when we first did, started doing the cast hands, we had a huge amount of failure. I mean, I bet you more than 50%. We had somebody who was working in our studio who refused to demold things for us because she was like, it's too depressing <laughs> because so much was broken. But I think we tried everything that, that could fail and it did. <laughs> but from that, we kept all those pieces because there's something to learn from each one of them. One of them might be you learn about vitrification and what causes this. Another might be about annealing or compatibility, or some of them we kept because they weren't what we thought they should be, but in them you saw potential for another piece or something that was really exciting. And a lot of the ones with the kids' hands, a finger would break off or something like that. Just because and it was really fragile. We had to redesign our molds to work with that. Yeah. And along the bottom of that shelf, what you were seeing was all the little tiny models our kids made. So all the little birds, our kids came to the studio with us all the time. So they were always making things and we were casting with them. And they'd try things we thought, oh, that'll never work. And then when it did, it gave us the possibility for more something new. So our children have been both models for us in our work. They're an yeah. inspiration for us. Oh. And um, when, when my older brother died, oh, we're getting an echo. Here we go. When, right. when my older brother died a few years ago, we were talking about what would be the bonds that would hold our three children together in the future. And so they became the inspiration for this next piece, which called What Binds Us. And although it's very personal because it is our three children, I think that it also speaks to very universal things about the bonds that hold families together. And we also were talking about there's some bonds that are very supportive, but there's also some bonds that restrict us and hold us back. This is a little bit of the process of making a commission piece. It was a, a commission for the CAM Teapot Foundation. And we started researching the tea, tea leaf itself, tea plant, and found some tea leaves and started casting them to make the teapot. And we were also looking at how tea has held a position in society over the years where it was used both in ceremony and also in our everyday events when we would sit down and share with others. And so we wanted that teapot to be raised up by the hands in homage to it. So in the bottom left, you can see Kate um, making some tea leaves from an alginate mold out of wax and put it all together out of wax. And here's the finished piece. Um, the teapot could have been functional, but uh, we fixed it to the hands so you wouldn't be able to use <laughs> to pour it. it, whatever. But we also thought when we, we're thinking about this piece that was really important to us that the piece be transparent glass and not opaque. We wanted it to have a, a life sense to it and that light transmitting through the glass made it glow and feel like it had an inner energy. 
So this is another one about our collaboration and it's Kate's hand in my hand. And we have used each other as um, subject matter for a number of our pieces and to talk about our collaboration. We've done a whole series of pieces called What's Between Us. And hopefully it's a universal thing when two people make a connection that um, this works for everybody in some way. The hands here are a, a couple in the area that work with glass and they're holding a, a part that we hand sculpted. Out of wax. And John and I have often been out in the community and you're working on it. We always make the element that the hands hold first. And so you complete it and then you're, sometimes we have a person in mind whose hands are going on it, but sometimes we finish it and we're like going, what is this going to be? And so you start looking at people when you're out going, is that going to work? And you see somebody, you go, look at that person across the room. They've got really long fingers. They're beautiful. Maybe they would be a good model for us. Or a lot of times it's, in this case, it's somebody who's a friend. And this is a, a piece that shows where our discussion and ideas can take you. It started with this set of hands that are holding clock parts. And we were talking about our sense of time. How do you show time in a static piece? And the piece grew over a couple of years to talk about analog time and how things fade away, memories fade away, people fade away, just all sorts of ideas that we incorporated into this piece. And this piece actually has sound in it. So when you step up to the piece, the sound of a clock comes on in the background. And with that, all of these images that were collected are people from the, some of them were family, friends, some of them were images that a friend might have sent us. And we used um, a decal enamel process to actually fire them onto the glass. And as we were playing with all these different decals and thinking about it, we realized is if we move that glass off the surface of the painting, that it cast a shadow and added a whole nother dimension to the piece. As in, you can see the little girls, you actually see their faces in the whites of their shirt. And that's the shadow back behind showing through. Um, this is sort of a divergent from a lot of the pieces that we've done. And a lot of you maybe have never seen anything like this of ours. Um, we'd love to come back to something like this, but John and I have a tendency to have more ideas than we have time to complete work. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's something in the future. <laughs> so this table was inspired by looking down on a fern from a, a long ways and seeing the patterns that it made. And we thought, how can we get that in a piece of ours? What can we do to uh, show that pattern? So this gives you an idea. We collected ferns from around our, our property and cast waxes of them. And then we also we, made some of the waxes we made by hand on some mm -hmm. parts. And then we formed a piece of clay that's about the size, exactly the size of the glass table that we wanted. And we could press those uh, wax forms into it to give us a, a, a slug that would, we could make a mold from. It would have the leaf patterns in it. I'm going to stop you just for a moment here, Kate and John. Um, we've seen quite a range of work so far, and I just wanted to see if any of the attendees had any questions uh, before we move forward. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box and we will get to them. Uh, one question I had from someone is, what product are you using for your decals for that photography installation you showed? Um, it was called In Plain Sight, and they've changed their name, and right now I'm drawing a blank as to what the new name is, but it was... Think, weren't they out of Minnesota? They're out of Minnesota. And they actually um, print the, the you vitreous sent, enamel onto uh, a, a transfer. So you send them the photographs, and they send you back the decals. Okay, thank you. And someone else was wondering if any of your children are artists. No, but they all easily could be. They're very talented. Our one son actually has a woodworking studio set up in his dining room of his condo in LA because he doesn't have a place to work. So he's just doing Japanese joinery. Our daughter is a, an incredible writer and she's working on a novel, but she also has a regular job. Yeah. So our kids all have, and our other son is very artistic as well, but they, I think they watched their parents and said, we're going to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> 
And one more question about the clock piece. Uh, someone is asking if the time is symbolic. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> so let's pull it down now. So if you see everything is just a little bit after 12, it's sort of that feeling that it's- It's just past midnight or it's just past its time. Things have gone a little too far. And part of that came from, we were caring for John's father who had dementia and he was slipping into a completely different time and place. And it was also that whole thing of that, this time won't be known by other people at We're some point. We're moving to digital time. Little, a lot of small children can't look at a clock face like that and tell you what time it is. It just doesn't exist for them anymore. All right, thank you. Um, please go ahead and I will pause again at some point if we have more questions. Yeah, going forward. Okay. okay, so this is just pulling that clay out of the finished mold. And sometimes we double fire the mold. Sometimes our glass reacts with it a little bit. So we do a double firing. And because of that, we're using um, special mold materials. And here you can see there's a mold on the left and a piece on the right. And one of the things that I think is always informative, if you just looked at this piece, she'd go, oh, well, how did you get there? But it's all of the pieces before that that inform you. So it was making those cast blocks where you look through something that made you realize how different it feels when you look through the glass to an object versus looking at it when it's on the surface. And these table pieces are an opportunity for us to collaborate with the blacksmith that does our forging work for us. He told us if you can make it in wax, I can probably make it in steel. So, so we'd, we'd yeah. take him a piece of wax and say, can you make this? And he'd make one part and we'd go, great, now make three or four more. And or change it a little bit like this. And so it was a very collaborative, really fun process working with Zach. And the other thing is, is that our, our pieces, because we usually have a lot of series going on in our studio at once, what we might be making in the table might also influence what we're making with hands or the other way around. You can see this flower motif in this one, which shows up in these pieces. So you can see the flower in the hands on the right. And then the piece on the left, we did a, we've, we've been working on a whole series of Ikebana inspired pieces. And they started from a potential project. Looks like we have a small connection issue. So if everyone can just bear with us, I'm sure that they will be reconnected in just a moment. Can you hear us now? Yeah, you're back on. Thanks, Kate. Okay, good, good. So we had a, a possibility for a project at a university that was quite large scale. And we thought, well, we can't do it with just glass. We thought we'll use glass and steel. And that's what started the idea for the first Ikebana piece, but that project got tabled. So we loved it. So we said, let's go ahead and try it. And in the process of starting to do the flowers where they stood by themselves, we got more and more involved with how the glass flowed in the mold. And really we're focusing on that. When we do pieces, we have a notebook that we take a lot of notes in so that we can go back and reference it in the future to see how something worked. And you can see Kate's loading powdered glass into this mold. And all of the color in this yellow flower with the orange center is all from one mold. It all was cast at one, one time. So we literally would measure out all of the different colors and would have to get a sense just by trial and error of how quickly it's gonna, what pattern you're gonna get from it flowing and also have a sense of how much that glass is gonna melt down and how much it's gonna take to fill a certain area. So this is the commission piece we got for the Ikebanas. And here's on the left is a, what we might have submitted to the client for them to see it possibly in their space. The finished half, a partial of the finished piece and in progress, there's Kate with it before we finish the metal. And it was a, a seven foot tall piece. And it's really wonderful when you can work with a gallery and a client and come up with something that you're all really excited about. It's fun, clients will push you to try something a little bit that's maybe you're out of what you're used to doing. In this case, it was just the sheer scale of it. Those are what seven feet tall was larger than we'd ever done before in, it, in one of the Ikebana pieces. And um, we were really pleased with it. And I think they were too, it was pretty exciting to see it installed. 
So we push the flowers a little more and there's a whole series of ikebanas that are made with boat forms as the vessel. And we added the element of that um, central egg form, our, our ideas of potential and um, the ikebana boat form, you can make an arrangement that indicates you're going on a voyage, you're returning home or you're at anchor. And we were just intrigued with that idea. We have a few questions that came up regarding your mold making process. Um, could you please tell us what type of clay you're using and what mold materials? Oh, so, okay. so clay. So we have, our studio pretty much anything goes into the rule. So with the, the clay, it's usually- We'd go to a supplier in the area and say, do you have anything a little bit softer than normal clay? And if they didn't, we'd just take whatever they had. Um, so the clay isn't that important. It's just that it has the consistency to take a good impression. And it doesn't have grog in it because it's really hard on your hands if it does. So it's just a straight up clay. But we've also worked with plasticine. Um, it really depends on what the piece we're making. With the, this piece, like this fern piece, it literally was just like clay that somebody might fire for making a piece. So the mold materials, the inner layer is probably Ransom and Randolph number 910. It has a lot of aggregate in it, but what happens with that material is it will not break when you double fire it. And it's very strong. So for a lot of the castings we make, it's too strong. So we, we do a layer of the 910, then we do a layer that's got more plaster silica or sand, plaster silica in it. Then the final layer, this bottom part down here is plaster sand vermiculite. Mm -hmm. So it really, our, our mold materials really vary depending on what we're casting. Okay, how do I get out of this? And the stems on the Ikebana piece that you showed, are those metal going into the glass flowers? Yes, um, no, right going into the glass flowers. So the stem itself is steel, but that little section right are, where the flower attaches to the glass is actually bronze that we pour in our own studio. Oh, okay. And then one final question. Someone is curious about whether you have any practices or rituals that help your creative spirit, like drinking tea or perhaps something meditative. Okay. So, this so is next. we love hiking and we cross country ski and we get out. Uh, we have a dog, she needs a lot of walking. So <laughs> we get out on some of the trails in our area and it's just beautiful. There's all of the layering and different light. Every time you go out, the light's a little different. It gives a, us a chance to clear our heads and talk about what, what we might be working on or what we might like to work on. Our morning hikes that we do or walks around our property are oftentimes that time where we're able to talk about an idea or a solution to something that we've been struggling with. It's really that time. And I think that our walk and our outside time is pretty important to us. And so are our kids and their ideas. When, when our children were young, we wake them up at two in the morning and drag them out into the field to watch shooting stars or whatever it was, just to keep them involved. And as they got older, their passion started to, to show off on us. Let's give our sons a look at SpaceX now. So here's a star catcher in a northern light inspired by our son's astronomy. But also, if you look at some of our older work, when there was the Saturn flyby, we did a piece that had little Saturns in it in some of the layering. And the layering and the, the um, cutting on the piece on the right was sort of a precursor to the gems that we're cutting. And it was really at that point that we first started really looking at how when you cut the surface of glass, it changes the view into something and it will change as you move around it as the light travels through the piece. So in 2017, my younger brother came to me and he said, we're doing a new building. And he goes, I'd like to get a piece for the lobby. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And at first we were like thinking he wants a small piece like 
something that you, that you something. would hold in your hands. And then as the conversation went on, he said, yeah, I'd like you to consider making a piece that like hangs in the lobby. It's got 18 foot ceilings and he starts describing it to us. And John and I are like, whoa, <laughs> he's talking about like a serious piece, really big. And um, he also was talking about what this new building facility was going to be. They're a construction company. And he started talking about that all sorts of groups of people come there and they each bring their expertise and their ideas and their energy. And then they come together to make something bigger and better than what any one of them could do on their own. So we took the idea of the cut gem and then expanded it into uh, concentric spheres. And here you can see, I've got a, a camera in my hand and I'm photographing up into our model of the space. And our studio doesn't have the high ceiling. So to get the perspective that you might have in the office building, I'm laying on the floor trying to take a picture of it. So here we are installing the piece in Wisconsin. And that piece gave us ideas for more work and variations on it. And as we started making models and as we finished that piece and hung it, we started thinking about, you know, one of the things that really needs to be added to this is light. So this is the full-size piece. The slide before was our model for it. And there's lighting incorporated in the metal framework around the glass. There's a close-up of it. And with this piece, not only do we put lighting in it, but we also started programming the light because we were really excited about the idea of being able to use light to both engage the viewer, but also to make your eye travel. In this one, when you enter the room, the light sequencing starts. And she's in there, our daughter, to give you a sense of scale as well. Mm -hmm. So this series of pieces is the one that won the award for the JRA's um, top 10 through Artomatic. And it's always so fantastic to get that sort of feedback when you start a new series for someone to acknowledge that, that you're maybe on the right track. Because even when you're a successful artist and work for years, I think it's really important to have that feedback sometimes you kind of work in a loop all by yourself and you don't have that perspective outside. This piece will probably be at Momentum very shortly in their new space. So when we completed the bigger pieces, or actually it was while we were working, and then we also started thinking about how do you incorporate motion? This might be a little choppy for you, but it gives you an idea of the, the motion and the view that you get into some of the gimbal pieces that we're making. The inner spheres are all cut so that you get a view down in from certain angles of the very inner sphere. And the piece changes as it moves. And we feel like so fortunate to work with really fantastic galleries have had really great collectors over the years. Habitat has placed one of these pieces in a museum for us. This one's working with a solid glass. And should be off there. One of our sons said, oh, it's almost an example of chaos theory. The rotation and the changes in the way it rotates is not very predictable. It'll speed up, it'll change direction, it'll slow down and then speed up again. What we really love about this motion is it changes what you see in the piece. So at one minute, you're going to see something completely different because of the cutting on the surface and how the light interacts with it. And we do have a few questions on this series. Um, you had mentioned that the light source on the ceiling installation was in the metal frame, I believe. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, could you expand on that a little bit? And in terms of your tabletop pieces, is that just having um, external light from a different source or is there also light within the piece? Some of them have only external light mm -hmm. and the, these pieces have uh, LED strips in the framework. So, that so it's actually embedded in that. So I don't know if John can chill with the pointer on like, well, probably like on this one, try that one down. This one you can see, yeah. or maybe this one you can see um, 
to go and zoom in. You can see the little dots. So the light is reflected. So it's in the outside rim of that. So it's actually sandwiched between two pieces of metal. And then if you go on, just you can go to and, and this one, the light is in that little, it's in the base. So it's shining up almost like a flashlight. And when it runs, the, the frame interrupts the light. So it'll flash a little bit. Okay. And someone is also asking, in terms of the glass itself, are you using polarized glass so that the pieces change with the viewing angle? Uh, no, we're just using our furnace glass. We use the same glass a lot of the time, not always. We use a lot of different glasses, but a lot of the time we'll use the same glass for casting and blowing or hot working. And I know that we talked a little bit about this before uh, in terms of where you're creating the work and you do it all in your own studio space, um, just sort of moving things around, correct? In terms of where you find the place to, to set things up. Yeah, our blowing room tends to sort of be our flex space, well actually our gallery space. When we were in the middle of laying out the glass for our public art piece, our whole gallery floor was covered with glass. Or right now, our hot shop is full of steel. So we might be doing welding down there one day, and then there might be a month where all the welding and all the metal work is put away, and we're doing the um, glass blowing there. All right, thank you. To, we're not afraid to use somebody else if they can do part of the piece better than we are. The, we thought we had someone set up for this metal fabrication. We ended up having to do it ourselves. But on the gimbal pieces, we actually are using a fabricator to do those because those are, it's really important that it's very exacting if you want the motion to be smooth. So we're using fabricator on that. So that's all the kind of thing that they do. And someone did ask if you could um, define what a gimbal is. Uh, traditionally, a gimbal is something that would be used on a boat to hold a cup upright. Um, because of the bearings and the way we're using it, it's maybe called something else, but I, that was the best I could do as far as a, it. What a So what it's, a it's like you're taking pivot points and so that if your boat is rocking like this, that it will try to, it will try to right it is what the gimbal does. And since there's a couple of different pivot points, it's always trying to bring it back to a balance. So with these, we're putting it on an eccentric. It's not, it's not flat so that it would stay upright. And you give it a little push to start the motion with it. Okay, great, thank you. So this was our first outdoor sculpture and um, it was um, the Spartanburg Water Company came to us asking us if we would submit some designs for an outdoor sculpture that both exemplified what Spartanburg Water does and um, would be something that could be there long term. They'd had a water fountain in the past and it was a lot of maintenance. And at first they were like, we're getting rid of the water fountain. And then they decided we're a water company, we want water. So not only were we dealing with building a sculpture, but we also had to think about all of the added complications of having water underneath it. And they wanted it to uh, hint about the three rivers that come together in that area. So that was part of our design considerations. So here we are in our latest project. It started, um, I guess it was 2019 was when we first got the request for proposal from Muskegon to create an outdoor sculpture for one of their parks. And I don't know if we hadn't had such a long history with Muskegon, if we would have just like jumped in on it right away. But Muskegon, Michigan is one of the first places that we showed early on in our career. Um, there was this wonderful woman named Corky Tuttle who had a gallery and she was just really fantastic about promoting us. So we saw Muskegon on the list. We knew where Muskegon was. We knew about the city and we were like, yeah, we'll try that. And we grew up in the Midwest, so we had an idea what, what it was like. You know? And John and, and our daughter both went to school at Interlochen Arts Academy. So we spent a lot of time when we would visit on Lake Michigan and just loved that area. Um, 
So with the proposal, they were wanting something that would speak to the community, who they were and where they came from. And here, um, we picked as one of the top three and we were asked to do a scale model that was one inch to one foot. So here's the model we're working on out of steel and glass. There's a industrial base there that the metal is significant of for us. And the colors of the glass are for the, the trees and the, the water and the sky. So here's the finished scale model before we presented it. This is where it would have actually gone is on that pedestal that says Heritage Landing. So we didn't get that commission. For that location, but they immediately came back to us and said, actually, we have someplace else where we really think we'd like to have your piece. Would you redesign something and submit it to us <clears throat> for a traffic roundabout on Lake Michigan? And when they sent us pictures of it and we saw where they were talking about, we were so excited because it's such a fantastic fit for this piece because you really see the sky, the water, and the green of the trees really are the backdrop from it. And uh, the process also led us to realize that if we were gonna do this, we really wanted to learn a CAD program. So we took the month of March, actually it ran into April and May, I think a little oh, bit yeah. of learning Fusion 360, which is a CAD program so that we can produce drawings for this project. And it was very much learning a foreign language. John and I had no CAD background beforehand, but as frustrating as it was, it was also pretty exciting to see it start to come together as we started to understand You could it. see the different perspectives by turning the model. It was really- So you, you could feel like you were driving around it and start visualizing what would really happen as you moved around the piece. So we got the contract thinking about how do we actually make this piece yeah oh we thought about it a little bit before <laughs> then but but you have to really like start digging in so here's john um he's actually patterning a piece of graphite for our casting and you can see on this piece here this is the mold shape that we would need to cast panels for that and also the size to get the the size right we worked out some drawings and and bent the metal and put the molds together that Kokomo would use to cast the glass. Mm -hmm. So we sent both the graphite and all the molds to Kokomo, Indiana, and they cast it um, in their, their shop there for us. So here you can see they do ladle casting. So the CAD program allowed us to make really accurate drawings for our fabricator. Some of the, the drawings we have to work out by hand, but um, that's a great thing about the accuracy of a CAD program. It's, it's pretty amazing. So once we started ordering materials and they started arriving, we also had to finish all of the steel. Um, maybe in retrospect, it would have been better to hire somebody else to do it, but we wanted to have control over things and to also have a better understanding of what was going to go into the process. I feel like whenever you're doing something from the ground up, the more you know about it, the better you are as you move forward with projects. So here's the finish, the final finish. And we would put together one of the, uh, the rings before we took it to the fabricator, just to see what kind of problems there might be, how it would go together, um, some of the issues. And to also just think about, is it gonna give us what we want? So there's John, he's welding on some parts. And then um, we took the, the rings to the fabricator and he puts them together. And here I am at the fabricators, checking how the glass is gonna fit into the first ring. So when the glass came, we were, really pleased with the patterning and the sizes worked out perfectly. And you can see down here on the right, um, if you bring the point over down there, yeah. So those little metal parts are what we call U-forms. And those are actually what is in the ring and the glass is sitting on those. And that channel is to allow the LED lights to run through the outside of the ring. So one of the things that a project this size has that I guess we do have it in our other work, but it's not as obvious. There's just a lot of engineering and a lot of problem solving. You have a concept in your head and you want something to look like, 
but then you have to work out all those hundreds of details to make it come together. So the piece has over 150 of these castings in it. And we're just, we're checking them all, assembling them, thinking about how they're gonna to fit together. They're all hand cast, so they vary in thickness. And so we're like trying to match them up so that it's gonna work the way we want it to in the piece. So two questions quickly. Um, one, is the piece static or are there gonna be kinetic aspects to it? And the second question regarding the thickness of the glass for outdoor application. Okay, it will have dust to dawn lighting. Um, so that's why there's all the channels and the, um, that, that part of the engineering, we had to put access panels so they can change the LEDs should they ever fail. Hopefully they'll last for more than 15 years. And the thickness of these is approximately an inch. They're pretty close to an inch. Um, that was the mold, mold thickness and most of the castings they do are about an inch. Um, the piece that we did for Spartanburg, the glass was cast about an inch and a half, but that was a lot harder for them because that's not what they typically cast. But about an inch outside is really very durable. Um, for outside, under two inches thick and under 24 inches in any dimension without uh, any abrupt changes. So if you had a, a V form cut into one of these, that would make it weaker in an outside situation. But since it's a rectangular form, it's really pretty strong outside. What we don't want is someplace where water can collect and freeze and thaw. You want it something there, it's a flat surface that it's gonna shed off of. So we borrowed a truck. Uh, the legs still didn't fit on it. <laughs> it's been one of the logistics. It's like, oh, wow, this stuff isn't gonna fit in our van. <laughs> when they came back from the fabricator, we had a little bit of uh, finish work to do on them before we passivated them. And passivation is a process where you make it slightly more durable. It's stainless steel, but it, it can still rust. It's less stain. So yeah. you do the process of passivation, which brings the chrome to the surface. Yeah, if you're a Lucy and I are painting it outside. And one of the great things about having two sons who work at SpaceX is they're up on what's the latest in industry on all sorts of things. And so when we were talking about passivating, I'm like, wow, I don't even know where to begin. And they're like, you do not want to use the old school. And we couldn't have because we don't have the facilities for safety. But um, it's a citric acid that we um, use for passivating. And it's pretty, pretty um, innocuous in that you wash it down with water. It's not like it's toxic. So we're using a structural silicone to um, install the glass into the rings. And we decided we wanted to finish one of the rings before we did the install. So we would have a sense of what it was like to do this temporary install with the glass. So we would know if there was gonna be any issues with it. And at this point, you can see our studio is full. This is our hot shop and it was completely full from, from wall to wall. Um, you have to have a, a warm enough temperature oh, oh, I went the wrong way to uh, passivate. So we had to move inside to get the temperature yeah. high enough. To and passivate. John is like squished over in the corner trying to drill on the drill press the bases that the pieces of it actually going to be attached to eventually. So here we are, uh, we borrowed a, a warehouse space to be able to set the piece up because it's cold outside. You can see Kate in her winter jacket there. And just doing the layout was a, um, a lot of learning occurred during that <laughs> process. Here we are setting up the first set of legs and ring. And some of the, the final fabrication occurred here. So the layout was really important that we get it right. Here you can see the one with the glass and we're setting up the third one there. John is actually attaching the leg to the ring. Wow. So um, one of the things that's really cool about this process was seeing that the CAD drawings that we had done actually worked, as in that we got really fantastic measurements off of it, and also that we had a fabulous fabricator. Justin Turcote nailed it. The piece really came together without, without a hitch. It just went up. You can start to feel the feeling that you'll get around such a big object. 
we were working with all these little models and then it was so exciting to get it to the state where it was so big. Um, hard it, to find the right equipment to put it together. There I am standing on the very top of the ladder. <laughs> Paper that's on the leg, and it was just there as a protective coating during um, install so it wouldn't get scratched up. But we learned all, all about rigging and how a little bit more about safety. So here's our team um, that's um, Justin threw a coat on the right, and John and I in the middle, and then Lucy Clark in the back, and she helped us the last part of the install as well as with a lot of photography. And you can see this one ring with the glass is lit up. We don't have the access panels over the uh, lights, so it's not quite how it will be, but it's close. Yeah. So then we had to take it all down and bring it back to the studio, finish putting the glass in the other rings, passivate all the legs. You can see we're heating the hot chop with our little glory hole there. Here's the video. This is a time lapse, just to give you an idea of the scale that we're working. And this is the kind of jigs and rigs that we make for being able to install the glass. Fitting the glass into the spaces. That was another video. And this one might be bumpy again. Oh. It's a time lapse of us actually gluing in the, the glass. And with that, when you start a pro the process, you can't stop. It takes approximately four hours to do a ring this size. And as you go and you're putting the caulk in, the person has to come behind, smooth it, and then you have to start pulling up the tape because if the tape stays on too long, it doesn't pull up and give you a really smooth seam. This is about four hours. I think um, time-wise we should keep moving. Yep. The other thing is it's so big, we can't lift it anymore. So we have some safety ropes and an engine hoist. And just to move it a little bit, takes a, a lot of time and, and Planning. effort. Yep. That ring when it was completely done, I think weighed 370 pounds. And you can see here, if you look at that little spot where the pointer is over there, we had to, on each ring, there's one section where we had to cut the glass to fit. So on the left, John is diamond sawing some of the pieces for it. And this is our cold working room and our mold room, which all of them are now full of pieces, <laughs> pieces for the sculpture. Nope, with know. glass. But it's pretty exciting to see them all now coming together and get a sense of what that's going to look like when it's completely done. So here's our model placed into the actual setting. And here's the, the site itself. They've got the pad board, and they're placing these boulders around the outside of it. So we're really excited to go up there sometime after, after April 15th, weather permitting in uh, Michigan when everything's finally thawed out to do the install. And I think the thing I'm most excited about is seeing it when it starts to get dark and the dusk to dawn lights come out, because I think you will see seven floating rings in the sky of different colors. So we just want to thank all of you for coming today and bearing with us through this whole talk. And also for Demetra and Howard and AACG for making this happen. Um, it's really great to have an opportunity to share our work with others. Thank you, John and Kate. We do have a few more questions before you go. Okay. Um, a lot of interest in this outdoor project that you did, particularly regarding the scale and of course being outdoors and the durability uh, elements associated with that. I know that earlier you mentioned that if glass is going to be outdoors, in your experience at least, you're looking at less than a two inch thick piece and not more than 24 inches in any dimension in order to properly react to sort of the hot and cold um, differences in the temperature. But other people were wondering regarding the color. Do you have any issues with color fading or biofilm growth? And of course, well, I'll let you expand on that. Okay. Well, there will be some biofilm growth probably, but it, you're going to get that on steel or pretty much anything that's outside. Windows, yes. windows are a perfect example of the glass and inside outside interface, and they're washed on occasion. They're pretty durable. 
and they can be very much larger because they're not as thick. So the thicker, the, um, the smaller the glass has to be. And given ability wise, we weren't real concerned about things. We also, in a process like this, we had know that there's 65 mile an hour winds on that lake. And so the first thing that we did before we even accepted the project was have an engineer run stress loads on the design concept that we, we have. We consulted with engineers along the way just to make sure that um, our base would be rated for what, what it needed to be or the the structure would be strong enough not or to Or that flex. we're using the right kind of screws and the right kind of spacings and all of that sort of thing. And this question might be a little bit tough to answer in shorthand, um, but someone is just curious, given the scale of this project, and of course you sort of alluded to different challenges that you came across uh, throughout the process, how do you go about actually giving a quote for something that large? Very carefully. Um, yeah, normally <laughs> you would have a project that's similar. We calculated the weight of the steel. We went and asked the glass company that was going to do our casting what they would charge. And we um, had quotes on a lot. Well, we had quotes on everything before we started. The biggest thing that was the most difficult to calculate was labor. And it's John and Kate who the majority of the labor was. We were so we were just paying ourselves whatever, however long it took us. And so we probably did not, John and Kate did not get paid really well on this. <laughs> Everyone else who worked for us did, because we always feel like bottom line is I want anyone who works for us to feel good about it. And I don't think we'll lose money on it. No. That's, that's no, what's important. No. Us. And we, we, We've had a tremendous amount of fun making the piece, which maybe sounds weird. There was days where I would never have said There was that. so much to learn. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge learning curve. And I think that with all of our collaborative process and our, our work, learning something new is the most exciting to me. It's like when I look at something and it's, it, it's I don't know, awe and curiosity, I think are a big driver for both of us. And so to do something new and different like this is just a really, it's a, it's exciting process to me. And we saw in your presentation, a couple of the public sculptures that you've created. Do you also do outdoor residential sculptures? We would be happy to, we have not, we have not yet. at this point, but we'd be happy to do a project with someone. Okay. All right, uh, let me just see if we have any more questions. Someone is asking regarding the timeline, how long did that project take in its entirety? So we, I think the proposals went out to people in April of 2019. We made the first submission in July and it was January of 20. 20 that they came back and said make a new proposal and we actually didn't start we had everything in place for it but they didn't have money in hand and we didn't have a contract till july 1st so we didn't actually start making the piece till july and 1. we're getting close to done but we're not quite done yet. we just are, we're to the point where what we have left is to put the lighting in the rings Okay, and uh, lastly, could you just give us an, um, a brief mention to the galleries that represent you, any exhibitions that you have upcoming so people can keep an eye out for your work? We'll have a retrospective show at the Bergstrom Mahler in Nina, Wisconsin uh, next fall. Mm -hmm. uh, we're showing with Habitat Galleries, with Momentum Gallery. Raven Gallery in... Um... Asp not Asp yeah, Aspen, um, Edgewood Orchard Gallery in Door County, Wisconsin. Um, oh gosh, I know I'm forgetting. If you go, yeah, please go to our website. Our website has under contact has a full list of who the galleries who rep us are. And I apologize as I know I've forgotten some people. <laughs> All right, thank you. And uh, just a reminder to everyone that all of our lectures are recorded and they are uploaded to the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass YouTube channel. So at some point um, in the next couple of days, you'll see this recording go up there. If you'd like to share it with your friends, please do so. And uh, thank you again, Kate and John, such phenomenal work. And we were really, really thrilled to be able to, to visit with you today. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, John and Kate. It's wonderful. Thank you, John Thank and you guys. Kate. John Fantastic. And Kate Great Seattle. to see you. Thank you. Miss your faces. Thank you. Thank you, John. We Kate. loved it. That was one wonderful. wonderful, fantastic presentation. Absolutely. No. Bye. We went. Big thumbs up. Fantastic couple, fantastic work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. 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 Stay warm. You can't yeah. wait to see the finish. <laughs> I'm wearing a uh, vest in my basement. There you go. <laughs> Bye, John and Kate. I'll see you later. Bye, Thank Kelly. You. Bye, Kelly. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Bye. Thanks, John and Kate. We loved it. Oh, thanks, Matthew. Oh, we loved it. Aaron, do you yeah. have that green teapot? No. It's at the CAM Museum. Oh, the foundation. No, John and Kate, you're going to have to repeat that program in Muskegon at the Muskegon Museum of Arts sometime <laughs> in a few months. Okay, sounds oh, good. Well, thank you. All right. Good. Good to see All you. Right. <laughs> Goodbye, John and Kate. It's good to see you. Yep. Great. It was great to see John on a I like that. It's wonderful presentation, guys. Beautiful. <laughs> Maybe she keeps her name. Maybe he's Littleton. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks, you too. It might be. John and Kate, there were 200 people who uh, attended the talk. Oh, that's fantastic. Fact, some people left. People. Great Very job. Thank, Thank you. So out of curiosity, Howard, do you have the ability, did you, can you share or save what all the comments were? Because the chat. the chat part? I did. Thank okay. you. Thank Good. you. Because <laughs> there's no way you can read that and give a talk. <laughs> So it looked like our it looked like our uh, connection was stable enough to uh, to do all right. Good. All right, I'm gonna. If anybody else wants to say goodbye, I'm about to end the um, the talk. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kate. Thanks so much, kids. It was good to see you again. Yeah, yeah, good great to see, to see you, too, you guys. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yep. You're welcome. Bye, Susan. We're some of the lucky ones. We've got those beautiful hands <laughs> with the jewel seed. So it's still our prize. Oh, good. Thank you. We love it. So. All right. Bye.